welcome back to Jobs, Money, Debt, Economic Common Sense, a new online weekly video for debunking myths concerning unemployment, deficits, the national debt, and our monetary system, and how we can create sustainable prosperity for the 21st century. Let the discussion commence. Last time, we discussed how education and training alone cannot explain unemployment and underemployment, and so education and training programs cannot eliminate persistent joblessness or generate full employment. We have to increase the total number of employment opportunities. Today, we're going to turn to another of the foundational issues to be addressed in the show, the nature of our monetary system and its implications for public policy. Back in the early 1990s, when I was a PhD student in economics at the New School for Social Research in New York, I started teaching introductory economics courses around the metro area to make some extra scratch. One of the things that surprised me the most was how many of the students thought the United States was still on the gold standard. The idea that dollars are intrinsically worthless was a shock to many of them. They were also surprised at how few countries in the world had ever had a convertible paper currency on a metallic standard, and for those that had, how relatively short the period of time during which the system was in place. We have to be a little careful with that term, convertible, because dollars can be converted into gold, of course, just not at a fixed exchange rate. You can take dollars down to the jewelry store, the pawn shop, and convert them into gold, but you'll pay market prices. So that distinction between fixed and flexible exchange rates is crucial. And that also helps us to understand that there are other types of fixed exchange rates besides metallic standards. These days, the more important type of fixed exchange rate is when a country fixes the exchange rate between its own currency and another country's currency, the dollar, for example. Monetary unions, such as the Eurozone, often begin with member nations fixing their currency's exchange rates to one another and only later introduce an actual currency. The other important characteristic of charterless money, sometimes called modern money or state money, or fiat currency with a floating exchange rate, is that the state, that is government, has a monopoly of issue. What that really means is that the state names and defines the unit of account. The unit of account is a very important concept for understanding money. Otherwise, there is the danger of confusing or conflating money and the money thing. In other words, we don't want to confuse the unit of measurement with the thing it is measuring. In economics, this is so crucial, the importance of the distinction between real resources and accounting information can hardly be overstated. Resources like human labor, natural resources, machines, and so on, are finite in ways money as accounting information, numbers entered in a ledger, keystrokes, is not. You can run out of land, but you can't run out of acres. You know who also understood this? Alan Watts, who is best known for introducing many Americans to Eastern philosophy and religion. In an essay on money versus wealth, he wrote that it was just as if someone had come to work on building a house and the boss had said, sorry, baby, but we can't build today. No inches. What do you mean, no inches? We got wood, we got metal, we even got tape measures. Yeah, but you don't understand business. We've been using too many inches, and there's just no more to go around. Warren Mosler has made a similar point by emphasizing that no matter how many goals Cristiano Ronaldo has made, the stadium never announces 
Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we must suspend the match. We've run out of points. Absurd, right? But this is precisely the mistake that Al Gore made when he argued that to save Social Security, we needed to take the budget surplus and put it in a lockbox so we wouldn't run out of money in 75 years when your kids are ready to receive their benefits. So in 75 years, we open up the lockbox and take out the green pieces of paper. But if we have no food or houses or schools, what good are the green pieces of paper going to do us? On the other hand, if in 75 years, productivity is continued to increase so that the working population is able to produce enough food for themselves and the non-working population, then we can always make the green pieces of paper. And we don't even have to worry about running out of paper and ink, because these days it's all electronic transfer and online banking. We can no sooner run out of money than we can run out of numbers. This is another reason why the national debt clock is so truly ridiculous. Yet because it is used to scare people like the elderly and others who depend on Social Security to live, it is not funny. And because such propaganda may be used to destroy the most successful social program in history, it is dangerous. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money the banks have um, accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account that they have with the Fed. So it's much more akin, uh, although not exactly the same, but it's much more akin to printing money than it is to borrowing. As money monopolist and issuer of the intrinsically valueless currency, the state does not need the public's money in order to spend. What the state needs is for the public to accept its otherwise worthless bits of paper. If the state does not need the public's money, why does it tax? By imposing a tax obligation and announcing it will accept only its own monopoly money in payment of taxes, the state creates a demand for its intrinsically worthless currency and gives it value. Guess who also understood this? Adam Smith, who wrote in The Wealth of Nations that a prince who should enact that a certain proportion of his taxes should be paid in a paper money of a certain kind might thereby give a certain value to this paper money. As monopoly issuer of the currency, the state could not collect any money from the public in payment of taxes unless it had first spent or lent or given that money to begin with. The first key for any successful money is acceptability, general acceptability. General acceptability is driven by the money's acceptance by the government in payment of taxes and other obligations. Taxes are not levied for the purpose of generating revenue. A money monopolist spending is never revenue constrained. This is what is meant by tax-driven money. Taxation creates a demand for otherwise worthless currency. Next time, we'll discuss the implications of tax-driven money for fiscal and monetary policies and managing government budgets and the national debt.